And all right, this is going to be part three of preaching through Lamentations chapter number three. So we broke this chapter into three parts. Uh, I'm not going to go over that uh, particular rhythm or sequence of the, the 22, 22, you know, 66 and 22 in detail again. I've repeated that a few different times. Uh, but here in uh, Lamentations chapter number three, we're just going to dive right into verse number 45. Verse number 45 in Lamentations chapter number three reads, Thou hast made us as the offscurring and refuse in the midst of the people. All our enemies have opened their mouths against us. <clears throat> Fear and a snare has come upon us. Desolation and destruction. Now there in verse number 45, we find an interesting word, and this word is only found one other place in the Bible. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter number 4. 1 Corinthians chapter number 4. Now that word is offscurring. Offscurring. That is a, a word that we only see one other time in the Bible. It's a word that I have personally never heard used outside of the Bible. So the only time I've ever heard it is the two times when reading from beginning to end in the Bible. And what offscurring is, is it's basically uh, the way that I've heard it explained, I've looked it up and is exactly the way in which it, it was explained to me the first time I've ever heard anyone try to define it. Offscurring is basically the scum. When you have you know, washed a dish or something along those lines, if there's you know, some sort of gunk that has built up on something and you basically you take something and you just scrape it off or you just use a sponge maybe and just wash it off. It, that's the off scurring. You're scurrying it off, and then that is what you have, you know, that is what is, 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 has actually been the product of what has been scurred off. And that is, uh, you know, the, the, the way in which you are doing it. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter number 4, and I want you to look with me at verse number 10. We'll read the context of this whole uh, passage. It says, We are fools for Christ's sake, but ye are wise in Christ. We are weak, but ye are strong. Ye are honorable, but we are despised. <laughs> Speaking about the apostles, those that are being looked down upon when it says despised. Even unto this present hour we both hunger and thirst and are naked and are buffeted and have no certain dwelling place. And labor, working with our own hands, being reviled, we bless. Being persecuted, we suffer it. Verse 13, being defamed, we entreat. We are made as, and then it says this, the filth of the world and are the offscurring of all things unto this day. So we basically, we get a little bit <coughs> of a definition when we look up the other time of the word offscurring being used. And that's basically what it is. It's the filth uh, of, a, of maybe a pot or something along those lines that you have scurred off, that you have pushed off, or that you have cleansed off. So it's pretty strong language when you're using that as an analogy to refer to a person, or you're using it figuratively uh, to refer to a nation like he is here in chapter number 3. He says, Thou hast made us as the offscurring and refuse in the midst of the people. Now what is the refuse? Refuse is just like how the word means. It's something you've refused. It's basically something that's reprobate. Oftentimes in the Bible, you'll see uh, uh, the, 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 uh, uh, the metal, which is unpure or impure, and which is also referred to as reprobate in Jeremiah, I believe it's chapter number 6. You'll see that referred to as the refuse as well throughout the Bible. So what it is, is it's basically the junk. It's basically what that which is not worth anything. It's basically that which is worthless with a, with a product. You know, when you're purifying something, you know, it purifies the gold and the silver, but it gets rid of all of the junk. What is it referred to as again? Uh, um, do you guys remember, either one of you guys? What is that word, what is the word that describes that which, the impurities of metal? Dross. dross. That's what I was trying to think of. The dross. So it, the dross is your refuse. That is what the refuse is. That's what's reprobate. You reject that. That's not what you're going to use. When you melt down the, the, you know, the metals, it, what it does is when you put it at a real high temperature, it, 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 it naturally just releases all of the dross. All of the dross just runs down and then you're able to get all of that out. That's what he's saying. He's likening you know, the whole nation under the filth of something. With that which you want to get out, get rid of, throw away in the garbage, throw away in the trash. It's the refuse. It's something that's been rejected or refused. Look at verse number <coughs> 46 now. <coughs> he says, <coughs> excuse me, all our enemies have opened their mouths against us. It's talking about being mocked by their enemies or the nations round about them. It says in verse 47, fear and a snare is come upon us, desolation and 
destruction. So he says, fear and a snare. Now, a snare is like a trap. Desolation is like being empty, saying that they don't have anything. They've been, you know, they're barren now. Everything has been taken from them. They've been robbed of everything. And then it says destruction. Obviously, everything's been destroyed. One thing I want to point out, go to Deuteronomy chapter number 28. <coughs> Fear is also a curse from God. God covenanted that He would bring fear upon the nation of Israel if they broke His covenant. I want you to go to Deuteronomy 28. That's where all the blessings and the curses are mentioned um, from the Lord when He gives the covenant to Israel and He makes the covenant with Israel. And in verse number 66, we see fear being mentioned as one of the curses that God will bring upon them. Fear is a curse from the Lord. It's actually a punishment from God. Look at verse number 66. Verse number 66. <coughs> And thy life shall hang in doubt before thee, and thou shalt fear day and night, and shalt have none assurance of thy life. That's an interesting verse because he repeats the same thing in the beginning of the chapter. <coughs> I'm sorry, in the beginning of the verse, and then at the end of the verse. And then right there smack in the middle, he says, and thou shalt fear day and night. If you look at the first part of the verse, it says, and thy life shall hang in doubt before thee. So what that means is they're going to be doubting all day. It's hanging in doubt. Like as in, it is uh, uh, you know, uncertain circumstances as far as whether or not they are going to live or not. They're hanging in doubt whether or not they're even going to be able to survive. Then the last portion is, and shalt have none assurance of thy life. It's the same thing, repeating the same thing. And then he says in the middle, and thou shalt fear day and night. What are they fearful of? They're obviously in a situation where their life is hanging in the balances. And God is saying that this is going to be one of the curses that if na the nation of Israel turns on him, that he is going to bring upon them. And of course, they did turn on him. They turned away from him. They broke his covenant. And God fulfilled his side of the bargain. And he did punish them and he brought his judgments upon him. This is proof of God being faithful right here. And what we see in Lamentations chapter number 3, go back to Lamentations chapter number 3, <clears throat> excuse me. In Lamentations chapter number 3, we see them being fearful because this is a judgment from God. So we need to keep that in mind. It's not something that we would oftentimes think of as being a judgment from God, but a way in which God can punish you. Because we think of what are the ways that God can punish us. You know, he can cause us to lose money. In, aren't these examples we always use? He can cause us to get sick. He can cause you to get into a car accident, to be harmed. He can even in an extreme case for an extreme sin, he can cause you to lose your life. But you know another thing that God can do is God can cause you to be fearful. God can instill in you the spirit of fear. And God does this kind of stuff. And it's interesting because we overlook this spiritual aspect of God's punishments. How did God punish Saul? And think of that, because Saul is the perfect example of a disobedient Christian. We see Paul, uh, Saul being given, Saul of the Old Testament, of course, King Saul, being given great opportunities. He's the anointed, he's the first king of Israel, of God's chosen people. He's the very first king. But then he turns from the Lord, he becomes very disobedient, and he you know, stiffens his neck and hardens his heart. He's a perfect example of a disobedient Christian. And what punishment did God choose to bring upon Saul? Was it losing money? No. Was it causing him to get sick physically? As in his just, not referring to his mental health, but just his physical health? No. No, you know what he did was he, he, he basically struck him you know, with a spirit of like anxiety. Right? It was, a, it was what it was referred to as an evil spirit, like harmful. He was constantly sitting around and he needed music to be played for him to try to soothe him. So you know what it sounds like to me is he just had bad anxiety. He had extremely bad anxiety, maybe extremely, a, a lot of fear, a lot of stress. He's just, you know, being, his mind is being vexed and tormented with all the, with all the harmful thoughts that he's having. You know, that can be a punishment from the Lord. And we, we may overlook this, <coughs> but that's what's being discussed here in Lamentations chapter number 3. When we read in Lamentations, it goes through judgments that God has brought upon them. And those same judgments are the judgments that God said that he would bring in Deuteronomy 28. When we read you know, about the temple being destroyed, about them being carried away, those are all judgments that God said he was going to bring on them. And then it came to fruition. Well, this is also a judgment of God. The fact that their, their life is hanging in doubt. 
the fact that they have none assurance of their life, the fact that they are fearful and afraid and scared that they could die any moment, this is a judgment from God. God can send fear into your life as a punishment. So if a Christian, Christian decides to live a sinful life, God may just choose to vex you with an evil spirit. God may just choose to vex you with anxiety, to vex you with stress, to vex you with confusion and madness and all other types of mental health issues. It doesn't have to, be, have to be physical health. It can be something spiritual where God just vexes your spirit or vexes your soul. So right here in Lamentations chapter number 3, we read over things like this. But verse number 47, when it talks about them being in fear, that's a punishment from the Lord. That's God sending this spirit of fear. That's God causing these things to happen that would bring fear into their hearts as well. <coughs> Then he goes on and he describes his lamentations or his lamenting in verses 48 through 51. It's about him weeping. Again, remember that lamentation chapter number 3 had a major shift from the first two chapters. The first two chapters was very allegorical. And it was about the woman which is Jerusalem. And this woman was weeping and crying. She had none to comfort her, right? She was crying out to the Lord and no one was answering her. We get to chapter number 3 and it's shifted majorly. And all of a sudden the writer, the author, starts speaking from his own personal perspective and it almost becomes his own personal diary. And that's what we've been reading about. And now that man is going to talk to you about his own emotions and his own feelings here in verse number 48. So that's interesting. It says this, <clears throat> Mine eye runneth down with rivers of water for the destruction of the daughter of my people. Now that's serious lamenting. It says his eye runs down with rivers of water. So what is he trying to de describe to you with this exaggeratory language? It's not just crying a little bit. You know, he's an art word crying, of course, is weeping, how the Bible referred to it. He, he is weeping a lot. He's just, his, his, his eyes are just constantly filled with tears and it just streams down his, tr his, his cheeks. He's just constantly weeping because he's looking around and, you know, he's seeing, you know, all these horrible things that are going on because of the destruction of his people he just continually weeps he says in verse 49 mine eye trickleth down and ceaseth not without any intermission so notice he's saying I'm just continually crying he's just constantly crying they were in deep sorrow it's easy to read about stuff and not to put yourself, you know, and plug yourself into their position or into their shoes. But they were in deep sorrow and deep lamenting and deep mourning. It was a horrible, horrible type of scenario that was going on. And it's so bad. I mean, imagine as a man for it to be so bad that all day, every day, you're just weeping. I mean, that has got to be pretty serious where you just can't get over it. You know, day after day after day, you're just weeping constantly because when you go outside and you look, it's just complete chaos. Everything is destroyed. Everyone's dying. There's dead bodies everywhere. The city doesn't look how it looked before. It's desolate. People have been carried away. Mothers are eating their children. I mean, it's just, it's horrible. It's, a, it's atrocious uh, uh, a type of situation that they're in. It's an, an atrocious situation. It says in verse 50, Till the Lord look down and behold from heaven. So he's saying, he, he cries like this, till the Lord look down. He's going to until the Lord looks down and, and beholds from heaven. That's what he's saying. Verse 51, mine eye affecteth mine heart because of all the daughters of my city. <clears throat> so he's referring to his, his weeping there again. Look at verse number 52. Mine eyes chased me, so, I'm sorry, mine enemies chased me sore. That means severely. They, they chased after him hard or strong. And then it says this, like a bird without cause. So he uses a bird as an example here. Have you ever watched a bird try to like swoop down and maybe grab a fish out of the sea? Or maybe you watch it kind of come down and maybe grab a frog or anything like that? I'm sure the kids have probably seen videos where birds just, I mean, they just especially eagles. You know, we used to go to the Cincinnati zoo all the time and they had a falcon there which is the the fastest animal in the world uh, it's even faster than any land animal it's like 220 miles per hour those things fly and they would they would uh, uh, you know they would the way that they would get this bird they would entice this bird to you know to fly at these extremely rapid speeds is they would feed it at the end of course like you do with any animal you always entice it with something right and they would feed it and I mean that thing I mean 
220 miles per hour. That thing would fly over your head in this little stadium they had set up. It's like a coliseum, actually, the way that it's set up. And I mean, that thing would swoop up and it would fly to these, it had these little station points all throughout that were, you know, scattered throughout the coliseum. And it'd go up to one corner and then it'd come up to the other side. And I mean, it came probably, what, three feet from your head, maybe four feet from your head. And it was just a gust of wind, just like, it would like blow you in your face. It's 220 miles per hour. That is fast. It would hit all of these different stands and then they'd have the, the whatever it was that they fed him. I have no idea. I think it was a mouse or something, wasn't it? They would feed him something. And I mean, he would just dive in and grab that thing and then they'd get him out of there because, you know, they're all these animal lovers. They don't want you to watch it like sit there and devour its prey. You know, that part of nature they don't like so much. But yeah, they would, they would, then they would just take it away. But you watch that thing just fly. And the whole reason it was willing to do all that, they trained it, of course. But they had to entice it at the end with what? With the food. I'm sure that that's how they got it to do it in the first place. And then they started, you know, you know, bringing certain, you know, maybe the food up to this station, then it'd go back. If you've ever watched, you know, maybe some, some type of uh, animals that will, that will swoop down and just grab fish out of the sea, it's amazing. It's just an amazing sight. I mean, they fly down so fast. That's what's being described here. He's likening that unto his enemies chasing him. When Babylon came in, <coughs> broke down the walls, <laughs> and tried to you know, slay and kill everybody and then take people captive, he's saying they were coming in extremely fast. And they were, they were, they were uh, seeking him and, and, and chasing him just like how a bird, because a bird is a perfect animal uh, uh, to uh, uh, you know, uh, parallel with that type of activity, how a bird would go and get its prey. Look Look at verse number 53. <coughs> they have cut off my life in the dungeon and cast a stone upon me. Now this right here could be, uh, uh, and I, I told you when I went through this, I was going to try to maybe find some different reasons why people may think that Jeremiah could have been the author. And this is actually a pretty good reason. Now this is, you know, when I looked this up originally, I never had... <coughs> any preconceived ideas whether Jeremiah was or was not the author. I had no preconceived ideas and I just kind of wanted to step back and just make my own decision about it. And I'm not decided yet, but this right here, for, for whatever reason, you know, be, you know, because people don't study the Bible, I guess, or don't know the Bible that well, um, you know, I don't know what it was, but I looked up everybody's reasons. I typed in, why do people think that, you know, uh, Jeremiah was the, the author? Who is the author of Lamentations? I looked up, multi, I read multiple different articles on reasons why. Nobody had any good reasons. Nothing at all. There was nothing that popped into my mind. But this right here seems to be one of the most compelling one of the most compelling reasons why Jeremiah might be the author. Now that is if it is literal. Let me say that. That is it is if this is literal. He has been speaking in a lot of poetic ways. And what he said was, verse 53, they have cut off my life in the dungeon and cast a stone upon me. Now what happened to Jeremiah? He was thrown into the dungeon. Now, I would say the people that originally thought that Jeremiah was the author, they got it from somewhere. Now, if people today don't know the Bible and they don't know a reason why, that's different. But they're just repeating other people from the past who had studied the Bible and had come to real conclusions and did have legitimate reasons why they believed that Jeremiah was the author. This is a pretty good reason. This actually makes sense that if I'm going to try to base it upon anybody and if, <coughs> and if you can study it and determine who it is and really draw a real conclusion, it would seem that this would be a pretty good point to say that Jeremiah was the author. Uh, I'm not going to turn to the passage, but this actually happened to Jeremiah uh, uh, exactly the, in detail. He was taken in and put into a dungeon. And that didn't happen to a lot of people. Uh, look at verse number 56. Thou hast heard my cry, hide not thine ear at my breathing, at my cry. Now, right there, <coughs> what's interesting, and I point this out, pointed this out a few times, you know, uh, the Bible will parallel, parallel our breath. And we'll use almost synonymously our breath with us speaking. Uh, Psalm chapter number 33, verse number 6 says, For the words of the Lord are, or no, I'm sorry, for the by the word of the Lord the heavens were made, 
And it says, uh, uh, and all the host of them by the breath of his mouth. So notice the words of the Lord and the breath of his mouth, right? And then when Jesus breathes on them, he breathes and says. A lot of people look over that. I've never heard anybody you know, uh, uh, explain that before. But he, So he's breathing while he's speaking. That's why it says that all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine. It goes on. What it means by it's given by inspiration is it's, you've probably heard people say, well, I believe this book is God breathed, right? What, what they're saying is inspiration. That's what they mean. They believe that it's inspired by God. And all that means is this, God spoke these words. Because when you speak, you breathe. That's what happens when you, when you uh, uh, speak. You are breathing while you speak, right? Notice right here what it says. He says, at my breathing, and then he repeats himself, at my cry. Well, what does cry mean in the Bible? It means to yell. It does not mean to weep. It means to yell. He's just repeating himself. And, you know, a lot of people, <coughs> they don't understand. This is a very good uh, 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 tool that you will learn over and over throughout the Bible that you'll notice over and over throughout the Bible. And when you really learn this and understand it, it really helps you in your Bible study. Knowing that the Bible is really heavy on repetition. It repeats itself over and over again. And it does that for your own benefit. It is a predictable pattern. That's why. So when you notice this pattern, when you identify this pattern, you can count on the pattern. It means there's order there, right? It's like studying science. The way that you can study science is because there's order. You wouldn't be able to study something that's just complete chaos, right? They, per, they can predict that the same things are going to persist and keep happening. Therefore, you can test it. You can do the same thing with bi the Bible. You can test it and you, then you can extract or learn information from it. You can gain knowledge. When you, when, you do, when you run tests in science, you gain knowledge from that because there's a predictable pattern. Well, the Bible has predictable patterns of repetition, of contrast, and things along those lines. And when you realize that God, when he wrote the Bible, or when he uh, spoke the Bible, if you will, and had it pinned down by man, he had certain methods that were put into it. And, and there were certain patterns and things that will benefit us. And once you are able to identify these patterns, you can predict them and you can find them now that you know that they're there and then you can use them to define words and to learn more and to grow an understanding of different words. This is a perfect understanding. Once you want, because you take this for granted, but once you understand that the Bible repeats itself, <clears throat> you can use this and see, at my breathing, at my cry. And as I said, we take that for granted. A lot of people would mock when you try to say, hey, the Bible repeats itself. And my favorite example, just to shut people up, is Jesus when he says, you know, in Revelation chapter number one, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. It's like, goodness sakes. Three times in a row, he repeats the same thing. It's, it's, it, you know, it, it's in a little different way, but that's the whole point. He doesn't say, I am Alpha and Omega, I am Alpha and Omega, I am Alpha and Omega. No, he's saying the same thing in different words. It, ha it carries the same meaning or the same concept, and when you compare them together, you can understand what he means and grow in knowledge of what it's saying. Right here he says, at my breathing, at my cry. He is uh, restating those so you can uh, uh, know that when you yell, when you speak, your breath is going out. You know, you are breathing during that. I believe that it makes perfect sense that when God breathed the breath of life into Adam's nostrils and man became a living soul, I believe that he spoke. I, I, I personally believe that. I mean, I don't have a, 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 you know, uh, anything from that particular chapter and that passage that says that. But that was when he gave man life for the first time. You know, when he gave man eternal life, you know, the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit... Uh, which is our down payment of our eternal life or everlasting life, was when he breathed and, and said unto them, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. Right? So that makes perfect sense to me. That lines up perfectly. Every time God does something, he does it by speaking. So that makes perfect sense. You know, in my book, I believe that he probably spoke. Just like when he created the world in Genesis 1. Everything he's doing, he's breathing, but he's speaking. Right? So... Uh, <clears throat> Look at verse number, where do we leave off there? Uh, look at verse number 57 now. It says this, Thou drewest near in the day that I called upon thee. Thou sayest, fear not. <coughs> so now he's telling us, <coughs> verse number 56 and verse number 57, that he finally heard him, right? Right before that he told us, <coughs> he called unto him in the, <coughs> in the, he called upon his name out of the low dungeon. Right before that, verse 54, 
He said, waters flowed over mine head. Then I said, I am cut off. What he's explaining is that he's at his end. It, you know, this is, it's, it's, it's the, the very end of his, you know, his life, the opportunities of, you know, being saved, right? He's, he's basically run dry, if you will. And God does this oftentimes in the Bible where he comes in at the very last second to save someone. Brother Hall, I believe you and I were talking about this the other day. The very last second, he'll, he'll wait until the very last moment to when he's going he's gonna to dive in and save somebody. And uh, the reason is why, because he l receives glory out of people going through trials and, and putting all of their faith and all of their trust in him. Amen. So he receives glory out of that. And there's so many examples of this. And I've went over it a lot recently because it's kind of tied in with tribulations, trials, and trusting the Lord. And that's been a topic I've been going over. But you have like the widow, right? She had nothing left. He came in at the very last moment, right? He would run people down to the, you know, the manna stopped right before they went into uh, the nation of Israel, right? It ceased and then they went in, right? Uh, this happens over and over again in the Bible where it's just he takes them, you know, right to the end. God provides to a certain point, you know, with something and then he pulls back and then you just have to trust the Lord in, you know, in, in the very last moment. It's kind of like with Lazarus. That's kind of an example too. When Lazarus died, you know, uh, uh, he, he even allowed that to go on. And he, and he, you know, even death took place. And then God came in, Jesus came in and saved him. And, you know, it, what it does also is it creates a situation for a even bigger, where a bigger miracle is, is necessary. You know, so then he receives more glory, right? And, you know, if he came in and there was already quite a bit of food there, it's not that big of a deal. But when you're able to multiply just a little bit of oil and this, this enough, uh, you know, cake for, for, or enough flour for one cake or two cakes, and then he's able to feed you all the way through a famine, that's pretty incredible. Okay. So that's one of the reasons why God would do that, uh, is because he receives more glory out of it because you've got to trust in him more, and plus it's a bigger miracle now. Uh, look at... Uh, uh, so we read there verse 56 and verse 57. Now he finally hears from the Lord. So this is pretty big right here. This is huge. Now he finally hears from God. You know, of course we have the woman crying out and there's no, none to comfort her. That's talking about the whole nation of Israel. The whole nation of Israel or the whole nation of, let's say, uh, Jerusalem to be more concentrated there, to be more specific because that's where all this is taking place. There's none to comfort Jerusalem. Now we have this man, this individual crying out. And it, and it seems as if he finally has gotten an answer. It doesn't seem as if he did. He got an answer. He heard his cry, it says. And in verse 57, he, he responds. The Lord finally responds for the first time when there felt like there was no hope. God finally responds. And he responds to this individual. This is why the King James Bible matters with the thou's and ye and all of that. Notice that it's singular in verse number 57. Thou drewest near in the day that I called upon thee. Thou, say, thou sayest, fear not. Not there, I'm sorry. Uh, I thought that he referred to him. You know, disregard what I just said. Uh, maybe it's down a little bit further where God refers back to him. Um, but uh, verse number 58, he says, O Lord, thou hast pleaded the causes of my soul. Thou hast redeemed my life. The thou there is referring to the Lord. I thought there that he used thou when God referred to him. But I must have misread that earlier. Notice there that he tells him, fear not. And we you know, talked about that just a couple of Sunday mornings ago, of the importance of not being afraid and not being fearful. And obviously, it's easy to not be afraid when there are no problems, there are no trials. You only need to be told not to be afraid when there's something there, an object that's causing you to be afraid. When there's something that is you know, a threat that can instill fear, right? So now he's telling him, fear not. And he has a reason to be afraid. And you know, it can be difficult when there are real trials and real tribulations and real problems and real, you know, possibility, bad possibilities that could come about to uh, not be afraid. But God tells us to fear not over and over and over again in the Bible. We can take, you know, refuge in his words that we should not fear. He's the God of the universe. He knows everything that's going to happen. He knew exactly what was going to happen to Jeremiah, if that's who this was. He knew everything that had happened to him and everything that he had went through. And he knew what was going to happen in the future. And he still said to him, fear not. Fear not. We as Christians can take comfort in that. We can take solace in that and say, we shouldn't be afraid either. All throughout the Bible, God tells Christians, 
You know, be not afraid, fear not. Over and over and over again, not to be fearful. We as Christians should not live our lives in fear. Why? Because we serve the Lord, the God of gods. You know, He who controls all things. You know, He's, he's omnipotent. We have nothing to be afraid of except for the Lord. That should be the one thing that we are fearful of right. is the Lord. Then he says in verse 58, O Lord, thou hast pleaded the cause of my soul. Thou hast redeemed my life. So notice now he's getting some hope and he's speaking to God and he's, he's, uh, 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 he's now, uh, uh, you know, uh, he makes these different statements to the Lord. Look at verse 59. O Lord, thou hast seen my wrong. Judge thou my cause. So now it seems like this man, this individual, because remember this particular chapter has been this man speaking, which was very different than the first two chapters. Now it seems like he's speaking from his personal perspective. Yes, the city had sinned, but he's saying, what did I do? Plead my cause. I want you to notice that because that's important about now it's this individual that's speaking. Before, and that would be inconsistent with the other chapters, if you didn't rightly divide between the plurality of the nation receiving their just recompense. But then this man is saying, hey, plead my cause. I didn't do any wrong. <coughs> and if this is Jeremiah, it makes perfect sense because remember, Jeremiah is released. Jeremiah is actually given the option, hey, you can go to Babylon if you want. We'll take care of you or you can stay here in Jerusalem. Right? So that makes perfect sense if it's Jeremiah. Look at verse 60. Thou hast seen all their vengeance and all their imaginations against me. And that obviously you know, uh, speaks, that God, speaks to the fact that God knows your thoughts. And this is something that we should think about. God knows the things that you are thinking in your head and in your mind. Right? And uh, of course we need to uh, uh, try to not only live right as far as our actions outwardly, but we need to possess the right thoughts. We need to not be thinking you know, dirty thoughts or bad thoughts or sinful thoughts, being envious or whatever it may be. We need to have good, clean, pure thoughts. And it should, that should help the idea of knowing that God knows your, your thoughts. So if you're fearful of the Lord and then you understand, man, God even knows my imaginations. God even knows the things that go on in my heart. That should deter you from having bad thoughts. That should deter you from thinking bad things. Maybe hurting someone or whatever it may be. You hate people that you shouldn't hate. Right? It says that God knows their vengeance. He knows their anger. And He also knows the, ima the imaginations. Verse 61, Thou hast heard their reproach, O Lord, and all their imaginations against me, the lips of those that rose up against me, and their <coughs> device against me all the day. Behold, they're sitting down and they're rising up. He says, I am their music. Now, reproach is basically someone making fun of you. That's what oftentimes, a when someone is a reproach, that means that they have been mocked. That's what that means. And that's what's going on here. He says, I am their music. He, uh, if you've heard a few different times in the Bible, or if you've noticed a few different times in the Bible, the phrases byword and proverb have been used together. And oftentimes, that will be referring to songs that people are singing. Music will be kind of thrown in there. Oftentimes, you'll see a byword or a proverb or I've become their song, right? It's like they'll sing these songs that are like Proverbs or Psalms or whatever, and they would, uh, in these songs, they would sometimes mock their enemy. And in this case, they're mocking their enemy, which would be, if this is Jeremiah or this Israelite, whoever it may be. They're mocking him and making fun of him and, and, and looking down upon his destruction. He's become a byword. He's become something that... People have made a song. He's the, he, uh, earlier, I believe, in uh, this same chapter, he talked about how he was the song of fools, right? The fools are just singing a song, and you know, a lot of times you know, they would just sing these songs and mock people, right? So that's what he's discussing here. Now in verses 64 and 66, I want to spend a few minutes on this. It's not going to take long. We're going to be done a little bit early tonight. What we read in verses 64 and 66 is, these are, this is an imprecatory prayer. Now, this is not common in Christianity today at all. Uh, but it is, it is referred to as an imprecatory prayer. An imprecatory prayer is basically where someone will, will pray and they will invoke God's judgment. That would be a good way to put it. They're invoking God's judgment within this prayer upon another person or upon their enemy, of course. So they would be invoking God's judgment or, or the curses of God upon another person. This is biblical, and this happens all throughout the Bible. Uh, there are psalms that are, are long psalms, <coughs> uh, uh, you know, where there are imprecatory prayers. Now, I have two 
uh, pretty famous imprecatory prayers that are pretty, uh, uh, you know, detailed that I want to look at real quick. Psalm chapter 69 and Psalm chapter 109. So let's go to Psalm chapter 69 first. So slide in your bulletin there and uh, we'll come back to um, um, Lamentations chapter <coughs> number 3 in just a moment. Actually, you, just, you can just listen. What I'll do is this. I'll go ahead and I'll read Lamentations chapter 3, verse 64 through 66. And then we'll read it again right when we close. So you can hear actually our text first. Then we'll read these imprecatory prayers in Psalm 69 and Psalm 109. So Lamentations 3, verse 64 through 66 says this. Render unto them a recompense, O Lord, according to the work of their hands. So he's praying to God to punish them for what they've done. Give them sorrow of heart, thy curse unto them. Persecute and destroy them in anger from under the heavens of the Lord. Now, that's a pretty strong prayer for something very negative to come upon a person. It says in verse 65, give them sorrow of heart. So he's praying for them to be sorrowful. He wants them to be sad and sorrowful. And not only that, he says, thy curse unto them. So he's saying, give thy curse unto them. He wants, he wants God to give his curse or to curse them. Verse 66 says, persecute and destroy them in anger from under the heavens of the Lord. So that's strong language. Persecute and destroy them, he says. So let's look at Psalm chapter number 69. I'll get there myself. <coughs> Psalm chapter number 69, we'll look at that first here. Now, a lot of Christians, you know, they have this kind of, you know, all fluff type of Christianity. They, they want an all positive type of Christianity. You know what kind of Christianity I want? Biblical Christianity. That's what I want. I want biblical Christianity. I don't care what's offensive. I don't care what bothers people. I, I, don't, care. I don't give a rip about any of that. I love the Bible and I want the Bible. That's really what I want. I want to know what the Bible teaches and what this book teaches and that's what I'm going to believe and that's what I'm going to preach. And I don't care if people don't like it. I don't care if it, if it doesn't fit in with my society. I can look like the biggest stinking outcast in the United States that there is. And I don't care. Because if it's what David prayed and it's what we're commanded, because people could say, oh, that's Old Testament. You're commanded in the New Testament to sing the Psalms. So what we're about to read, you're commanded to sing in the New Testament church. We should be singing this. Now, if it doesn't apply to us at all today, that makes zero sense. And there is no, this major, people don't rightly divide the Bible nowadays because people don't like the Bible. They don't love the Bible like they should. They don't really study the Bible. So they don't know it like they should. But people don't rightly divide the Old Testament and New Testament, and that's people's cop-out. When they see something that makes them feel uncomfortable because their philosophy didn't come from this book, it came from the world. When they read something that makes them uncomfortable, what do they say? That's Old Testament. That's their way to just take something and just throw it away that they don't like. The book of Psalms is something we are commanded to sing in the New Testament. So what we're about to read is extremely applicable. It's very applicable. And it's not only the book of Psalms, we just saw it in Lamentations. There are imprecatory, imprecatory prayers prayed in the New Testament. So, so this is... <coughs> You even have them in Revelation praising God for God's judgments and asking God to judge. The souls in heaven are asking God to judge. They're, they're, a prayer means to ask. So they're standing right before God and they're basically asking God to pour out His judgment upon those that are on the earth. I mean, how much more New Testament do you got to get than the end of the Bible? You know, it is aggravating when people would just, they just try to just dismiss things in the Bible because it makes them feel uncomfortable. I love the, even if it made, there's a lot of things that I read in the Bible, a lot of things that I personally read in the Bible that made me feel uncomfortable too. But you know, I got to the point where when I would read those things where I just love the Bible and I would just say, you know what? I'm wrong. You know the reason why you feel uncomfortable? It's not just because instinctly or anything like that. It's because you were conformed to the world. That's why. And we have to, the Bible tells us that we need to transform our minds. The Bible tells us that we need to wash our minds with the Word. You, you need to stop thinking like the world and think like the Bible. So listen to me. There's going to be a transition in your thoughts. There's going to be a transition in your philosophy and in your ideology and the way that you view the world. The way that the, the world you know, believes and teaches and, and looks at the world is very different than the way the Bible does. So you would expect to see a transition. So look here with me at Psalm chapter number 69. And I want you to <coughs> notice, <coughs> you know, this prayer that David prays. And remember, let me tell you this too. 
David is referred to as the sweet psalmist. That's what the Bible refers to him as. He's the sweet psalmist, okay? Number one. Number two, David is a man after God's own heart. That doesn't change in the New Testament. And I'm sure you can see I'm a little frustrated because this is frustrating when you think about this. Some people just want to dismiss it. David would still be a man after God's own heart in the New Testament with these psalms, okay? God doesn't change. So if he loved David, he would love David today. So look at Psalm chapter number 69. Look at verse number 1. Save me, O God, for the waters are coming unto my soul. <coughs> I sink in deep mire where there is no standing. I am coming to deep waters where the floods overflow me. I am weary of my crying. My throat is dried. Mine eyes fail while I wait for my God. It's interesting how similar this is already to what we were reading in Lamentations. The Bible is oftentimes like that because it's the same author. You know, uh, Obviously, maybe different human instruments, but the Spirit of the Lord is the same author. They that hate me without a cause are more than the hairs of mine head. They that would destroy me, being mine enemies, wrongfully are mighty. Then I restored that which I took not away. O God, thou knowest my foolishness and my sins are not hid from thee. Let not them that wait on thee... I'm sorry, yeah, let not them that wait on thee, O Lord God of hosts, be ashamed for my sake. Let not those that seek thee be confounded for my sake, O God of Israel, because for thy sake I have borne reproach. <coughs> Shame hath covered my face. I am become a stranger unto my brethren and an alien unto my mother's children. For the zeal of thine house hath eaten me up, and the reproaches of them that reproach thee are fallen upon me. When I wept and chastened my soul with fasting, that was to my reproach. I made sackcloth also my garment, and I became a proverb to them. They that sit in the gate speak against me. I was the song of the drunkards. Notice that. Remember I mentioned that? There's a lot of uh, parallels here with Lamentations. He said, I was the song of the drunkards. Just like we read there in Lamentations. But as for me, my prayer is unto thee, O Lord, in an acceptable time, O God, in the multitude of thy mercy, hear me in the truth of thy salvation. Deliver me out of the mire and let me not sink. Let me be delivered from them that hate me and out of the deep waters. Uh, let not the water flood overflow me, neither let the deep, deep shallow me up, and let not the pit shut up her mouth upon me. Hear me, O Lord, for thy loving kindness is good. Turn unto me according to the multitude of thy tender mercies. Uh, I could have swore that this was the right chapter. Yeah, it, is. it is. Where are we at? Uh, verse, I mean, it gets real bad in 27. It gets real bad in 27. Uh, let, uh, let's start in... Uh, yeah, 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 it is. It's exactly what I wanted. Verse 22 right there. That's what I was looking for. Okay, uh, look at... Yeah, we'll keep reading. Thou hast known... I'm in verse 19 now. Thou hast known my reproach and my shame and my dishonor. Mine adversaries are all before thee. Reproach hath broken my heart... Broken my heart. And I am full of heaviness, and I looked for some to take pity, but there was none, and for comforters, but I found none. They gave me also gall for my meat, and in my thirst they gave me vinegar to drink. Now watch this. <clears throat> Let their table become a snare before them. And that which should have been for their welfare, let it become a trap. So their table is where they are fed. He's saying, let that be a snare. Let that be something bad that they get caught in and they're hurt by. Verse 23, let their eyes be darkened that they, sh that they see not and make their loins continually to shake. So basically, he's cursing them with blindness. He's saying, let, you, let them, let them you know, uh, uh, be blind the rest of their lives and then also let them constantly be filled with fear. He's talking about their loins shaking. Verse uh, 24, pour out thine indignation upon them and let thy wrathful anger take hold of them. Let their habitation be desolate and let none dwell in their tents. So he's saying just destroy all of them. Right? Desolate means that it's empty. No one's there. No one's living there. A habitation, a ha you know, to, to inhabit something is where you're living. He's saying just kill all of them. That's what he's saying. Kill all of them so there's none left. No one's alive there. Verse 26. For they persecute him whom thou hast smitten, and they talk to the, they talk to the grief of those whom thou hast wounded. Add iniquity unto their iniquity, and let them not come into thy righteousness. So he's basically saying like he doesn't want them to be able to get saved even. He's praying that these people would not be able to come into God's righteousness, right? That's God's imputed righteousness. He's talking about salvation here. Look at verse uh, uh, 28. He even mentions the book, <coughs> book of life. Let them be blotted out of the book of the living, living like life. 
and not be written with the righteous. He is literally praying for people to not get saved. He's praying so people would not go to heaven. Now, your average pastor, if you asked him, do you think that it is righteous to ever pray for someone to not get saved? What do you think they'd say? <gasps> of course not. That's horrible. You should, you should always pray for people to get saved is what they would say, right? You know, for every person you should pray that every single person should get, should get saved. Is that what David did? Obviously, we know that the Spirit of the Lord is writing here. But this is a man that's speaking these words and writing these words down. Right. God's using a man, right? So if it was, if it was wrong for David, or if it, let me say this, if it would be wrong for you, then it would have been wrong for David to do that as well. So notice what he's praying. Look verse 29. But I am poor and sorrowful. Let thy salvation, O God, set me up on high. I believe that's the end of that, isn't it? Where he's praying against them. Now, you know, that's why Brother Hall, I'm sure, said that it gets really bad right there. It's really negative. He's literally praying like, add iniqu you know the sin that they have already? Add sin on top of that so you can punish them for some more sin. That's what God, that's what David is saying right here. At, give more, look at their account, look at all the sin that they have, okay, and they're going to be judged for that. Give them more sin so you can judge them more. And not only that, don't allow them. Don't give them the opportunity to come into your righteousness. You know the translation? Don't allow them to get saved. Don't allow them to have the opportunity to be redeemed. He says, you know what? Go ahead and, and blot them out of now. That's like a reprobate, basically. That's what a reprobate would be. If somebody is blotted out while they're on this earth out of the book of life, that person has no hope of salvation, right? So basically, what he's saying for this person is take away their opportunity to get saved. That's Bible. That's what the Bible is saying right here. That's what David is praying. That's clearly 100% what's being said. Take away their opportunity to be saved. That may, may make you feel uncomfortable. You might not like that, but that's what the Bible teaches. Right. That's what David's saying. Now, you know, the Bible is negative, and we have to face that, and we have to understand that. We have to... I love all of it. I love every last bit of it. You know, maybe it makes you feel uncomfortable now. Then you know what you need to do is just read this psalm over and over again. There are imprecatory prayers, and what that is is a man... Praying to God and asking God. What he's doing is he is invoking God's judgment upon another man. And it can be so bad that they may pray for another person to never even be able to get saved. And there are wicked, wicked, <coughs> excuse me, evil people out there. Like the, that fall into the category of what David is praying for right here. People that would fall in the category of being a reprobate that can never have salvation. They've gotten to the point where they've rejected the Lord. Their heart is so corrupt and evil and dark. God has just rejected them. There are people that God has just rejected. There are people that God does not want to be saved. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 cannot be any clearer. That God sends them, you know, strong delusion. That, that, that they should believe a lie. What's the reason that they should believe a lie? Why? That. They all might be damned who believed not the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. So he sends the lie so that they would believe the truth so that they would be damned. God doesn't want them... So, what you, you know, those types of people... Now, let me say this too. You shouldn't be flippantly praying imprecatory prayers. That would be sin. If you were invoking or attempting to invoke God's judgment upon a group of people or upon people that are not you know, in, in this category, that would be wrong. And that would be sinful. So... You should not flippantly pray a prayer like this. I would not suggest you to pray a prayer like this unless you are one million percent sure that this is someone that God would do this to. I mean, be a million percent positive that they fall into the category of just a God-hating, you know, horribly wicked person. It would be best for you not to pray at all if you're not positive. It would be best for you not to even pray an imprecatory prayer. Let's look at one more, Psalm 109. And we'll go back and read that other, uh, the, those other three verses one more time there in our text. Look at Psalm 109. <coughs> Psalm 109. This is, this is uh, very, very strong. Look at Psalm 109, verse 1. Hold not thy peace, O God of my praise, for the mouth of the wicked and the mouth of the deceitful are opened against me. They have spoken against me with a lying tongue. They compassed me about also with words of hatred and fought against me without a cause. For my love they are my adversaries, but I, <coughs> but I give myself unto prayer. And they have rewarded me evil for good <coughs> and hatred for my love. So notice David gave them an opportunity. Isn't that interesting? Even 
even after they had, had hated him and did evil unto him, he did good unto them. And then what did they do back? They gave him hatred back again and evil back again. It's almost like what happens with God exactly. It's actually identical to how it works with God. God gives opportunities. They reject him. God gives them opportunities again. He tries to be good to them again and give them another opportunity to get saved. And then ultimately God, as we're going to see David here, rejects them. Look at what it says right here in verse uh, 6. <clears throat> it's where it starts to shift. Set thou a wicked man over him and let Satan stand at his right hand. When he shall be judged, let him be condemned and let his prayer become sin. <clears throat> Let his days be few and let another take his office. Now, let's stop right here and look at a couple of things that he's praying and put this into context so we can understand the severity and the implications of this. So he says in verse 7, When he shall be judged, let him be condemned. So he's saying he wants this man to be condemned for the wrong that he's done. If you take this to its full extremity, he's saying that he wants this man to go to hell in that sense of condemnation. He goes further and he says, let his prayer become sin. So when you hear his prayer, consider his prayer sin when he prays unto you, Lord. Then he says this in verse 8, let his days be few. What's he saying? Cut his life off as soon as you can. Don't give him long life. Kill him as soon as you can. And then he says, and let another take his office. So whatever position or office that he's in, wherever he is in life in general, his office, let another person fill that. Look at what it says. Let his children be fatherless and his wife a widow. Now that's, that is strong. You notice what he just said. Let his children be fatherless and his wife a widow. He's saying take his life. Even this man that has a family is saying take his life. Now, a lot of people will be like, oh my gosh, that's a horrible situation. But if you stop and you think about maybe some man that is like, let's, let's just take the, just the epitome of wickedness and corruptness and everybody would agree. 99% of, you know, that's probably exaggeration. But let's just say probably 50% probably of Americans would even agree to taking a pedophile or some sort of molester and just putting him to death immediately. That, you know. Probably higher than 50%. The majority of, of people would say that's like the worst of the worst, right? Because what they're doing, they're corrupting that which is so innocent, right? It's just so evil. You can't get any more evil than a, than a child molester, really. Let's take that. Now, do you think that that man's children would be better off or worse off if he was out of the picture? They'd be better off, wouldn't they? Their, his children would be better off if he were to lose his life. How would his wife be? To have some just, just pure evil, just walking evil, just spending their, her life day in and day out with a man like that. She'd be better off without him. So this would not be a horrible thing. It would be a good thing, right? It would be a good thing if this man's life was taken, you know, taken from him in this sense. But notice that this is still the point. It's a serious, it's worded that way to show you what a punishment this is. It's a serious punishment. Let his children be fatherless and his wife a widow. Let his children be continually vagabonds and beg. Let them seek their bread also out of their desolate places. Now oftentimes, let me say this as well, children will be inherently, they'll be punished for the sins of, of their, not, they're not being punished, let me reword that, because they're not being punished for the sins of their fathers. That's incorrect. But they inherently will, will you know, take on the consequences of the sins of their fathers. Right? So it's basically like this. It's not that, hey, my father was you know, uh, a murderer, so now you're going to get the death penalty. That's not what's going on. What, what happens is, when you're in a position of leadership, and you're in a position where you make the decisions for your family, your family is going to go down with you. You don't only affect yourself. So that, that takes place in different situations. Look at verse 11. Let the extortioner catch all that he hath and let the strangers spoil his labor. Let there be none to extend mercy unto him, neither let there be any to favor his fatherless children. Let his posterity be cut off and in the generation following their name be blotted out. Let the iniquity of his fathers be remembered with the Lord. And let, not, and let not the sin of his mother be blotted out. Now this is a very, very serious prayer to the extent of cursing other people as well. And there's no way to get around it because that's what's going on here. He's saying to curse all of his habitation. Look at verse 15. 
Let them be before the Lord continually that he may cut off the memory of them from the earth because that he remembered not to show mercy but persecuted the poor and needy man that he might even slay the broken in heart. As he loved cursing, so let it come unto him. As he delighted not in blessing, so let it be far from him. As he clothed himself with cursing like as with a, his garment, so let it come into his bowels like water and like oil into his bones. So notice it just goes on and on of just horrible things that he is invoking to happen unto this man. And even as I said, those that are around him. Go back to Lamentations chapter number 3. Verse number 64, and we're going to read these last three verses here, and we'll end. So imprecatory prayers are biblical. Impre praying for something bad to happen to a bad person, and, it, and not just your average bad person like we're all sinners. That's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about God-hating, just wicked, corrupt, evil people to the cords. People with dark hearts that just devise evil upon their beds and want to hurt people constantly. The Bible actually supports and the Bible you know, propagates and teaches to pray that bad things would happen to those people. And uh, we can see that in the book of Psalms and we can also even see that in Lamentations. We see that in the New Testament as well. Lamentations chapter number 3 verses 64 and 66. This chapter ends here in these three verses with an imprecatory prayer that the author writes. And it says this again, Render unto them a recompense. O Lord, according to the work of their hands. Give them sorrow of heart, thy curse unto them. Persecute and destroy them in anger from under the heavens of the Lord. So we need to, you know, believe and love all the Bible. Even parts that may make you uncomfortable, if you know that it says what you think it says, if you're positive that it's saying something, let me word it that way, then you should love that, you should believe that. And if it makes you feel uncomfortable, you need to read it more, Amen. right? Because that doesn't make it not true. That just means that you're conformed to this world. You need to transform your mind. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, God, we thank you for your word. We thank you for all of it. We know that it's pure, dear Lord God. We thank you for everything that you've done for us, dear Lord. We ask you that you'd be with us and help us to trust in you more after all of this that's going on and, and uh, help us to, uh, uh, to uh, love your church and, and the New Testament local church uh, uh, as we should, dear God, and to enjoy the time while we're here, enjoy our fellowship, dear Lord, and, and to learn and grow from it. We ask you that you would bless everyone that was able to make it out tonight, dear Lord, and those that, that couldn't. And we ask you that you would be with us continually throughout this week and just continually bless us. We love you so much and in Jesus Christ's name. Amen.